This is the third video of chapter 20, dealing with the kinds of heat transfer that we can have. There are three ways in which heat energy can be transferred from one location to another, and they're all illustrated in this picture here. We can have conduction, which would be the immediate transfer of heat by molecular collision, so everywhere along that substance, the molecules are trading and transferring energy uh, across that substance. Convection is the actual movement of the heated substance itself. So as the um, fire is heating the air and the smoke, and the smoke actually travels and heats the hands above the fire, that would be due to convection. And we can have radiation, which is actually heat by electromagnetic waves. So the electromagnetic radiation by the light traveling to your hands can heat your hands that way and that wouldn't necessarily need to uh, travel through a medium. Here's a conduction example. Conduction can only occur if there's a difference in temperature between two parts of that conducting medium. So in this particular case, the molecules will vibrate more rapidly where the temperature is higher at the stove position and then they will uh, transfer some of that energy to other molecules nearby within the pan and they will start vibrating with greater amplitude. And as this energy is being transferred along the pan, these, these, this energy gets transferred more and more towards the handle and eventually the heat will travel all the way through the handle and um, you might be able to feel it there. So in general, metals are good conductors because they contain a lot of free electrons and the free electrons can transfer this energy more easily. Poor conductors would be asbestos, paper, and gases themselves. Conduction, if, if Q is the heat transfer and we do it in a time delta T, we can think about power Power is energy per time. In this case, it would be the heat transferred per time. If we consider a wall with an area of A, a temperature change between the two sides of the wall of delta T, and a thickness L, then the heat transfer rate through this wall is equal to Ka delta T over L and that would be the power transferred, K-A-T over L, cattle, cattle. Okay. Where K is a constant of the material, otherwise known as the thermal conductivity of that material, and would be an intrinsic property of the material itself. Here are some common thermal conductivities of some common materials in joules per second per meter per degree Celsius. Silver, 427. Copper, 397. Aluminum, 238. These are very good thermal conductors, most likely because they are very good uh, electrical conductors. They have free electrons that can transfer the energy easily. On the other hand, we have some nonmetals that are good insulators ice, concrete, glass, water, asbestos, wood. These are good insulators and ironically, ice being a good insulator would make a good um, substance to make a house out of in cold climates. So even though it's cold outside and you've got frozen ice, it acts as a good wall like an igloo to protect you from the outer cold. An even better insulator is air uh, with the lowest thermal conductivity on this list. So gases are good thermal insulators. Let's try an example. A glass window pane has an area of three square meters and a thickness of 0.6 centimeters. If the temperature difference between its faces is 25 degrees Celsius, what is the rate of energy transfer by conduction through the window? If we're talking about rate of energy transfer, anytime you're talking about rate, you're talking about something per time. And in this case, energy per time, we're talking power. So we're looking for the power through this window pane. It's cattle, 
the thermal conductivity of the glass times the area of the glass, change in temperature on both sides of this glass over its thickness L. The thermal conductivity of glass from the previous screen is 0.8. Area is 3 square meters. Our change in temperature is 25 degrees between the hot and the cold. And the length of this, the uh, thickness of this glass is 0.6 centimeters, which is 0 0.006 meters. Everything's in the SI system, so our answer is uh, 10,000 joules per second or 10,000 watts. If I had multiple materials, I'd have to worry about the respective thermal conductivities of each material and, of course, their thicknesses. So I'd have to modify this um, power formula for each material. To do that, we're going to take the thermal conductivities down into the denominator, divide each thickness by their thermal conductivities, and add those together for each material that we have. So our power equation, heat per time, is now area times a change in temperature over the summation of all these thicknesses over their respective thermal conductivities for each, um, each uh, material in this compound slab. Well, we have a definition for a length or a thickness of a material divided by its thermal conductivity. That definition is called its R value. So we would sum up all the R values in the denominator of this equation and the numerator we have the area times the change in temperature. The thickness divided by the thermal conductivity is the R value of the material. It's often expressed in British units of feet squared degrees Fahrenheit, hours, per BTU. A BTU is 1,054 joules. A foot squared is 0 0.0929 meter squared. An hour, of course, is 3,600 seconds. A degree Fahrenheit is 5 ninths or 0.556 degrees Celsius or Kelvin. So essentially, if we want to convert from from an R value to uh, SI value, we would want to multiply um, by 0 0.0929 to convert the feet squared to meter squared, 0.556 to convert the degrees Fahrenheit to Celsius, 3600 to convert to seconds, and divide by uh, 1054 to convert to joules, and hence we're going to divide our R, R value by 5.67. 1 over 5.67 is this value. A nice number to remember, 5.67. Physicists like to do that. They like to make numbers that are easy to remember. Here are some R values for some common materials. Fiberglass batting, 18.8. This is in the British uh, units. Um, six inches thick for that one, 3.5 inches thick. 10.9, styrofoam 5, brick 4, um, insulating gl glass 1.5, you get the idea. But you would divide each of these R values in the British system by 5.67 to get the corresponding value of R in the SI system. So let's try a compound slab of materials, in this case we have a thermal window. A thermal window with an area of six square meters is constructed of two layers of glass, each four millimeters thick, separated each other by an air space of five millimeters. If the inside surface is at 20 degrees Celsius and the outside is at minus 30 degrees Celsius, so we have a temperature change of 50, what is the rate of energy transfer by conduction through the window? Again, we're looking rate of energy, we're looking for power. So we have three substances. Really, we've got the glass, the air, and the glass. We're going from hot to cold. Our power is equal to the area times the change in temperature over the summation of our R values for each of these substances. R values are going to be the thickness divided by their respective thermal conductivities. Area is six square meters. We have a temperature 
uh, difference between uh, 20 degrees and minus 30 of 50. And then we have glass, four millimeters of it, and the thermal conductivity for glass is 0.8. We have five millimeters of air, thermal conductivity of 0 0.0234. And we have another four millimeters of glass, thermal conductivity of 0.8. And if we uh, figure all this out, we get that our power is 1.34 times 10 to the 3 watts. We have about 1,340 joules per second of energy passing through this window. We can also have a heat transfer by the actual movement of the heated substance. This is called convection. So in these smokestacks, where the actual smoke is, is traveling as the heated substance from point A to point B, then that is convection. When the movement actually results from the differences in density of the gas, it's called natural convection. And when the movement is forced by a fan or a pump, it's called forced convection. Here's an example of convection. We have a radiator in a room. It warms the air in the lower region of this room. Warm air rises. It's uh, lighter because it's less dense. So the less dense rises to the ceiling. As it rises, the denser, cooler air sinks and kind of moves in to where the other air was rising. And this causes a pattern where the air is exchanging through the room. So you have air rising, the cold air sinking, and causing a pattern where the movement in the room is continuous. And that would be a convection example. Here's another example of convection, forced convection, and also conduction. Um, cooling a car engine. We can imagine first we have a, a water pump, which is forcing water into the interior of the engine, allowing the heat to pass from the hot engine block to this cooler water. And then the water is forced um, out of the engine into the radiator. So we have a forced convection in that sense of forcing the heat substance to another uh, location. The uh, radiator allows the, um, uh, to heat up the air and then the air is blown away. So the radiator allows conduction to the air. So we have a forced convection of the water through the water pump and cooling the car engine. Other applications of convection, the hydro hydrologic cycle, the weather in general, where one area of the earth is heated up and air rises, causing storms to form, and then other air moves in, uh, the winds as, as a result. Heat and cooling in the oceans, El Nino and La Nina, are um, actual convection of, of heated or cooled water. Uh, radiator heat in the room, we just talked about that. Circulatory system within the human body is actually convection of, of warm uh, blood, and that can heat uh, the body as well. So the blood vessel network would carry warmth. Birds actually have a layer of vessel-free fat, which allows them to actually stay insulated. They can ruffle their feathers in order to increase their uh, thermal um, or their insulating properties, get low thermal conductivity, allow them to stay warm that way. And then another example, convection, red ties, nutrient-rich water is stirred up, combines that with warm water and grows algae, which is, causes the red uh, action within the red tides. So these are all examples of convection. Here's a beach scene, and it can illustrate um, all the types of heat transfer that we might be interested in. First, we got radiation from the sun bearing down on this beautiful scene. It's also heating the sand, and the hand, sand, by changing its temperature, will also um, radiate energy as well. So we have radiation coming from the sky, from the sun, and radiation coming from the sand itself. If we're standing on the sand, we can feel by direct contact the heat passing through the sand up into our feet 
and maybe passing up into our body that way. So that would be direct conduction that way. And the heat in the sand could be heating the air. The air could be rising, and that heated air would also heat us as it's rising up. So these are all the examples of heat transfer that can take place at the beach. It's a very good place to do our analysis and our scientific investigation of heat transfer. I think we ought to go on a um, scientific journey, a um, experiment to the beach to test this out, don't you? Field trip. Radiation. Radiation does not require any kind of physical contact. All objects radiate energy continuously by electromagnetic waves due to the thermal vibrations of their molecules and, and that's due to temperature itself. The rate of radiation is given by Stefan's law. Here is the electromagnetic power radiate energy per time by Stefan's law is proportional to the fourth power of the temperature. Power is equal to sigma A E T to the fourth power. Stefan's law, P is the power in joules per second or watts. Sigma is the Stefan Boltzmann constant and it is 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8 watts per meter squared per Kelvin to the fourth power. Note the nice number, 5.67 again, and this times 10 to the minus 8. Physicists like to make these numbers easy. 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. Too easy. Got to remember that one. A is the surface area in meter squared. E is the emissivity of the object. It varies from zero to one as a, as a fraction. The emissivity is also equal to the absorptivity of the object. So how much it emisses is also how much it, the rate at which it can absorb. The number is the same. Um, if you're absorbing though at different temperatures, then that would be a different power. So you have to consider that maybe your surrounding is a different temperature than, than you are, and hence your power exchange would be different. But if you're at the same temperature as your surroundings, then you have no power difference between your surroundings. Your, your emissivity and your assortivity is the same. And T is the temperature in Kelvin. You have to make sure when you use this law that you're using the Kelvin scale. An ideal absorber is defined as an object that absorbs all the energy incident on it. Emissivity in this case would be equal to one because emissivity and the absorptivity are the same. This type of object that absorbs everything of the energy on it is called a black body and it's also emit emissing at the same um, emissivity as well. An ideal absorber is also an ideal radiator of energy. Ideal reflector absorbs none of the energy on it and has an emissivity of zero. So not absorbing anything and it's not emitting anything. It has emissivity of zero for an ideal reflector. The net radiation would be the energy gained or lost each second by an object would be how much it emisses by minus how much it absorbs. So it would be by Stefan's law, sigma A emissivity temperature the fourth of the object minus whatever it's absorbing, whatever's coming in, which would be sigma A emissivity temperature of the surroundings to the fourth power. So power radiated by the object minus the power radiated by the surroundings into the object. That would be your net power exchange. When an object's in equilibrium with its surroundings, it radiates and absorbs at the same rate and at the same temperature, so its temperature will not change. It will maintain the same temperature, so no, no net exchange. Let's try an example. A sphere that is to be considered a perfect black body radiator has a radius of 
meters and is at 200 degrees Celsius in a room where the temperature is 22 degrees Celsius. Calculate the net rate at which the sphere radiates energy. So we want to know not only how much it's radiating out, but how much it's taking in, and the difference between the two would be the net rate. Now we're given this problem as the object being at 200 degrees Celsius and the surroundings at 22 degrees Celsius, but we know immediately if we're going to use Stefan's law, we're going to have to convert these temperatures to Kelvin. It's a black body, so we, we have an emissivity of one. Our temperature of the body is going to be 200 degrees Celsius plus 273.15 for a Kelvin temperature of 473.15. The temperature of the surroundings, T0, is going to be 273.15 plus 22, which would be 295.15 Kelvin. Of course, our sigma constant, Stefan Boltzmann constant, is 5.67 times 10 to the minus 8. And then the area that we're emitting this over is the area of a sphere, the surface area of a sphere, 4 pi r squared. That's going to be 4 pi times the radius of the sphere squared, 0 0.06 meters squared. And that is 4.52 times 10 to the minus 2 square meters. So we have all the variables that we need to make this work. Our power will be sigma a emissivity, temperature of the body to the fourth power, minus temperature of the surroundings to the fourth power. 5.67 times 10 minus 8. Area is 4.52 times 10 minus 2. Our emissivity is 1. Our temperature of the body is 473. Raise that to the fourth power. Minus 295. Raise that to the fourth power. Note you can't take the difference in temperature first and then raise that to the fourth power. Mathematically that's incorrect. So you have to have the temperature to the fourth power minus the temperature to the fourth power. And if we do that, that gives us 109 watts. So our net energy radiated per time is 109 joules per second or 109 watts. Here's an application of radiation. Radiation is electromagnetic energy. White clothing is a very good reflector, and by reflecting, they would not absorb, they wouldn't reflect emissivity closer to zero, and hence, it would maintain you as being cooler so you, since you're not absorbing this electromagnetic radiation. Black clothing could be also considered cool in a certain sense. You know, it's, it's, it's absorbing everything, and it's emitting everything, Half of what it's emitting is back outward, and the other half is inward. So you can have all this hot air coming in and hence, theoretically, heating your body. But if you keep your clothing um, pretty loose, that can cause a convection current to, to occur. You're heating this air, air starts to rise, and cooling air will come in, and you get yourself a little bit of um, air conditioning going on if you have loose enough clothing to allow you to stay cool. So even the, even the dark clothing could be, um, could be cool as well. Other applications of radiation. Most of the heat radiation we are accustomed to is due to temperatures of a few hundred Kelvin in the infrared part of the spectrum. Some nocturnal animals can actually see in the infrared, and we can't, we don't need it to survive, so we we're not adapted to that, but some nocturnal animals can do that. Infrared sensors are also used in defense weapons, since many weapons can be hot. Body temperature, radiation thermometer measures the intensity of the infrared radiation from the eardrum and measure your temperature as a result. The sun transmits energy in different forms of electromagnetic radiation. In the infrared, which you can't see, in the visible, which is most of the sun's radiation, which we're much accustomed to, and in the ultraviolet, which is uh, above the, um, the frequency that we can see. A greenhouse example. Visible light is absorbed into a greenhouse easily through the, the window pane, and then it can be readmitted as infrared radiation, which is less energetic and possibly cannot make it out through the window. So you have your convection currents of the heated substance, heated air, not being able to escape, and hence 
um, maintaining um, a hotter temperature inside the greenhouse so the greenhouse would work that way. Here's another application. The Dewar Thermos Flask invented by Sir James Koblen Zankowski. No, no, Sir James Dewar, named after Dewar. Uh, this minimizes heat by conduction, convection, and radiation. Everything that you can possibly do to try to minimize the exchange of heat transfer. It has an evacuated space, so there's less conduction and convection within that evacuated space, so that's good. It's got silvered surfaces, so that minimizes heat transfer by radiation because it's going to reflect either on the outside or on the inside, not allowing heat exchange to take place or be absorbed that way. It has Pyrex glass, which is a poor conductor, so um, it's going to limit the heat exchange through the glass that way. And it has a reduced neck size, which will also reduce convection and conduction of the air because of the, um, the constricted uh, opening of the thermos flask. So all these contribute to make this Dewar thermos flask less uh, susceptible to heat transfer and, less, and hence it can maintain whatever's cool as cool and whatever's hot as hot within the thermal flask. That concludes this lecture of chapter 20 and we will go on into a study of chapter 21.